It's our privilege to meet here this night under our Prophet's direction. It's especially our privilege to have him here with us. And I yearn that all of us here will have the spirit of peace as we seek unto Heavenly Father for the truth, studying the history of the Prophet Joseph Smith. I desire Heavenly Father's Spirit to be with me and all of you as we consider the story of the redemption of Zion tonight. A very well-known story, one of the most well-known stories. And yet this story tonight, though it is well-known, teaches one of the least learned lessons that the saints have been slow to understand the message from this great experience. We rejoice in the stories, the miracles, the blessings of God that attended the saints. We mourn as we read of the suffering they went through and also the failure as far as redeeming Zion. But what is the great lesson of Zion's camp? It is the great lesson of priesthood. They were to go to Zion following the one man. Joseph Smith was God among the people through the priests that he bore. And the men going in that camp were to follow him as one man, united, one in all things. And the great understanding of priesthood is that God and his prophets have the right to rule. And we, the saints who are under covenant to do so, we have the right and duty to obey. I'll say it how it should be. We have the right and duty to love to obey. This is the main lesson that Uncle Roy and President Jeffs gave why Zion's camp failed. Because they treated Joseph as a boy, just another man they thought they knew as much or more than the prophet. They didn't understand priesthood. Our prophet has taught us the reason that all people have apostatized. It is because they did not understand priesthood. This has affected hundreds of thousands who have been baptized in this dispensation a great falling away has taken place. And by now, this priesthood people should have learned the lesson. To understand priesthood, you must know and understand that God and his prophets have the right to rule in all areas of our lives. And we have the right and duty to love to obey. Now, you hear these words. This has to reach deep down into your heart. And it involves the purification of your character, of your heart. It involves a preparation of becoming like God, where you are filled with the Spirit of God. To move as one man, that Holy Spirit has to be in every person, where we will think, like God, desire what He desires for us. And it takes the work calls, the daily experience in connection to the tree of priests that we're connected to. So I will begin tonight repeating the lesson of priesthood, just a few quotes. 
We have this in the inspired version. Now Melchizedek was a man of faith who wrought righteousness. And when he, when a child, he feared God and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. And thus, having been approved of God, he was ordained an high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch. Today, President Jeffs is ordained after this same covenant. It being after the order of the Son of God. Do you understand what that phrase means? He stands as God over the people. Which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days or end of years, but of God. And it is high priesthood, the apostleship, and more especially the keys thereof, was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. Listen to the powers, the outward powers of this priesthood as well as the great gift of bringing a people into the presence of God. For God having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. And men having this faith, coming up unto this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. This priesthood even has the power of translation. Prophet Joseph Smith said, There are two priesthoods spoken of in the scriptures, that is, the Melchizedek and Aaronic or Levitical. This is before he taught about the patriarchal. Although there are two priesthoods, yet the Melchizedek priesthood comprehends the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood, also the patriarchal and is the grand head, and holds the highest authority which pertains to the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom of God in all ages of the world to the latest posterity on the earth. And this high priesthood is the channel through which all knowledge, doctrine, the plan of salvation, and every important matter is revealed from heaven. Its institution was prior to the foundation of this earth, or the morning stars sang together, or the sons of God shouted for joy, and is the highest and holiest priesthood, and is after the order of the Son of God. Being after the order of the Son of God means he can act in God's stead, of course, by revelation and under the Lord's direction. And all other priesthoods are only parts, ramifications, powers and blessings belonging to the same, 
and are held, controlled, and directed by it, by that one man. It is the channel through which the Almighty commenced revealing his glory at the beginning of the creation of this earth, and through which he has continued to reveal himself to the children of men to the present time, and through which he will make known his purposes at the end of time, Joseph describes three grand orders of priesthood. Listen to the power of the key holder of the Melchizedek priesthood. What was the power of Melchizedek? Twas not the priesthood of Aaron which administers in outward ordinances and the offering of sacrifices. I would recommend this be memorized, page 322 of the teachings. Those holding the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood are kings and priests of the Most High God, holding the keys of power and blessings. In fact, that priesthood is a perfect law of theocracy and stands as God to give laws to the people administering endless lives to the sons and daughters of Adam. The keys of Elijah are the keys of the priesthood in their fullness. When a man holds those keys, says President Barlow, there is nothing that he cannot do. He can do all things under the Lord's direction. Even to bring a people up into the presence of God, making their calling and election sure through these keys of Elijah. Section 132 reveals that there is only one man on the earth at a time on whom these keys and the powers of the priesthood are conferred, the keys of priesthood. And Uncle Roy taught us that all other priesthood, all other bearers of the priesthood only have a delegated authority to act under the direction of this high priesthood. The key holder, because he holds the keys, is the mouthpiece of God and he is the fountainhead. It is impossible for any man or woman to rise above that authority, that prophet. The keys of Elijah, the keys in their fullness, were held by Joseph Smith and by our prophet today. Page 337 of the teachings give us this description. The spirit, power, and calling of Elijah is that ye have power to hold the key of the revelations, ordinances, oracles, powers, and endowments of the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood and of the kingdom of God on earth, and to receive, obtain, and perform all the ordinances belonging to the kingdom of God, even unto the turning of the hearts unto the children, and the hearts of the children unto the fathers, even those who are in heaven. Through the binding or sealing powers of that priesthood. The power of Elijah is sufficient to make our calling and election sure. And then Joseph said, I will walk through the gate of heaven and claim what I see on, and those that follow me and my counsel. You've heard it said in our meetings, and it is verily true, that our prophet is everything to us. Anything else we would have on this earth will be taken from us. But what he gives to us through the power of the priesthood 
and through our obedience to him we will have everything we will never rise above him but it will always be in connection with that prophet and priesthood and because the priesthood he holds is eternal as God himself the blessings we receive through that priesthood will be eternal Uncle Roy gave this short lesson on priesthood. Let us keep in mind this order that the of the priesthood can function without the church, but the church cannot function without the priesthood. Priesthood is God on earth. When a man is called by revelation, and placed in the position of the high priesthood he is there whether the people accept him or whether they don't a man may be called by God to be the president of the church but before he can rule over the people in the church he must be sustained by them a king can't preside over a body unless there is a body to preside over but the priesthood is out of the hands of the people altogether. This priesthood is handled by God himself. And by these descriptions and quotes, may we see what power there was among Zion's camp. The prophet Joseph, holding these keys of priesthood, a man who could walk and talk with God, visit with angels daily. And may this people see what priesthood power is among us, if we will but unite and become one with him by becoming like him. I give this brief lesson on priesthood that the lessons of Zion's camp will be focused this time. Yes, it's marvelous what we read, took what took place. Imagine what will take place in the New Zion's camp with our prophet going before us and with us, the Savior and the prophets going as the angels of heaven leading Zion's camp, realizing that the Lord will redeem Zion. What manner of men ought we to be? Said the Savior. Verily I say unto you, Even as I am. And as we read this story, If you wonder what you would have done, Just think what you're doing now. Are you one with our prophets? in perfect obedience today is this how you've lived your life and are you prepared at a moment's notice to go and do any job he gives you that is understanding priesthood perfect obedience with the spirit of heaven guiding us in that obedience moving as by a hair under the direction of our prophet now this is how the new Zion's camp will be. This is how the first Zion's camp should have operated. And thus we'll go through the story tonight. I have displayed both the timeline and the map up here. If you picked up the timeline last time, you will see the map at the end. As far as you can see it, I hope it helps.
Zion's camp started on May 5th, 1834. In our last class, we described how Joseph went on a mission with many other brethren through New York. Hiram Smith went up, went up to Detroit. He would bring a separate Zion's camp meeting in Missouri. I will read through some details tonight. You can follow along by the dates I give. I started with the remainder of the company from Kirtland for Missouri. This day we went as far as the town of Streetsboro, 27 miles from Kirtland. Joseph names how Brigham Young and Joseph Young met Israel Barlow, invited him to come, and he joined Zion's camp. On the 6th, they arrived at New Portage, 50 miles from Kirtland. My company from Kirtland consisted of about 100 men, mostly young men, and nearly all elders, priests, teachers, or deacons. Our wagons were nearly filled with baggage. We had mostly to travel on foot. On the 7th, he says, there were 130 men. They organized the camp. He names Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery remaining in Kirtland. They did not go. There were a few men working on the temple, and there were some older people in Kirtland. So the young and middle-aged that he could gather were in this science camp. Listen to how he organized the camp. Through the remainder of this day, I continued to organize the company, appoint such other officers as were required, and gave such instructions as were necessary for the discipline, order, comfort, and safety of all concerned. A prophet describes how he taught them they were to move as one man and go without murmuring. They would move like an army, as you will hear in this description. I also divided the whole band into companies of twelve, leaving each company to elect its own captain, who assigned each man in his respective company his post and duty, generally in the following order. If you add these up, two cooks, two firemen, two tent men, two watermen, one runner, two wagoners and horsemen, and one commissary. A commissary would handle the money and purchase the needed supplies and food for their company. We purchased flour and meal, baked our own bread, and cooked our own food generally, which was good, though sometimes scanty, and sometimes we had johnny cake or corn dodger instead of flour bread. Every night before we retired to rest, at the sound of the trumpet, we bowed before the Lord in the several tents and presented our thank offerings with prayer and supplication. And at the sound of the morning trumpet, about four o'clock, every man was again on his knees before the Lord, imploring his blessing for the day. I remind us, our prophet has taught us, we should be moving as a Zion's camp under our prophet's direction today. This is how we should be living. Live unto God, which means live unto and close to his prophet. They continued to New Portage on the 8th, the 9th to Worcester, the 10th Mansfield. They encamped for the Sabbath in Richfield Township, and you can follow the map as I name these places. It was hard work pulling the wagons through the creeks and streams over the rough places. 
he had left Kirtland on May 5th. By May 14th, less than two weeks out, the first rebellion took place. We passed on to Bellefontaine, you can see that on the map, where we discovered refractory or rebellious feelings in Sylvester Smith, who expressed great dissatisfaction because we were short of bread. Although we had used all diligence to procure a supply, and Captain Brigham Young had previously sent two men ahead to provide supplies for his company. I remind us what Uncle Roy taught. The complainings, the criticizings, little things in our eyes are great evils in the Lord's eyes. By May 15th, it says they camped a little west of Springfield. I think that's on the map. That night, Moses Martin fell asleep on sentry duty, and I went and took his sword and left him asleep. That evening, or the next evening, the 16th, they held a court-martial because this man, Moses Martin, had fallen asleep. Joseph was teaching all the brethren a lesson. This evening a court-martial was held in the camp for the trial of Moses Martin for falling asleep while on picket duty. Brother Martin pleaded his own case, saying that he was overcome with fatigue and so overpowered that he could not keep awake. I, should, I decided that he should be acquitted with a warning never to go to sleep again on watch which was sanctioned by the court, and I took occasion from this circumstance to give the brethren much useful instruction. So there was a discipline. There should be a discipline among us, watching and praying always. On the 16th, Joseph he described how a feeling came over him where there had been much bloodshed. He says this, About nine o'clock while I was riding in a wagon with Brother Hiram, Ezra Thayer, and George A. Smith, we came into a piece of thick woods of recent growth where I told them that I felt much depressed in spirit and lonesome and that there had been, been a great deal of bloodshed in that place, remarking that whenever a man of God is in a place where many have been killed, he will feel lonesome and unpleasant, and his spirits will sink. In about forty rods from where I made this observation, we came through the woods and saw a large farm, and there near the road on our left, was a mound sixty feet high containing human bones. This mound was covered with apple trees and surrounded with oat fields, the ground being level for some distance around. That night there was a circumstance where they found out there was supposed bad milk. They heard that the milk was sick, or people were getting sick from it, all around the neighborhood around them. But Joseph gave this promise to the brethren. I told them not to fear, that if they would follow my counsel, and use all they could get from friend or enemy, it should do them good, and none be sick in consequence of it. And although we passed through neighborhoods where many of the people and cattle were infected with the sickness, yet my words were fulfilled. As Zion's camp started out, the mob, many wicked people, kept an eye on them. While passing through Dayton, Ohio, great curiosity was manifested. Various reports of our numbers and designs having gone before us, 
Some of the inhabitants inquired of the company where they were from, when Captain Young said, From every place from this, but this, and we will soon be from this. Where are you going? The answer, to the west. And this shows you how the Lord would blind the eyes of the people, of the wicked. Some ten or a dozen gentlemen came over from Dayton to ascertain our numbers, which they reported to be at least six hundred. The footnote says, We were followed by spies hundreds of miles to find out the object of our mission. And as people would ask, where are you from? They'd say, from the east. Where are you going? To the west. So the brethren didn't reveal all that they were doing. They were to keep it to themselves. And they were to not reveal who Joseph was. On the 17th of May, you can see the map, they crossed the state line of Ohio. At night a spy attempted to get into our camp, but was prevented by, my, uh, by our guard. We had our sentinels posted every night on account of spies who were continually striving to harass us, steal our horses, etc. This is the 17th of May, about 12 days out from Kirtland. And again, not just one, but many of the brethren had feelings and fought one with another. This evening there was a difficulty between some of the brethren and Sylvester Smith, on occasion of which I was called on to decide in the matter. Finding a rebellious spirit in Sylvester Smith, and to some extent in others, I told them they would meet with misfortunes difficulties and hindrances and said and you will know it before you leave this place exhorting them to humble themselves before the Lord and become united that they might not be scourged there you see he taught them to be one a very singular occurrence took place that night and the next day concerning our teams. On Sunday morning, when we arose, we found almost every horse in the camp so badly foundered that we could scarcely lead them a few rods to the water. The brethren then deeply realized the effects of discord. When I learned the fact, I exclaimed to the brethren that for a witness that God overruled, and had his eye upon them, all those who would humble themselves before the Lord should know that the hand of God was in this misfortune, and their horses should be restored to health immediately. And by twelve o'clock the same day, the horses were as nimble as ever, with the exception of one of Sylvester Smith's, which soon afterwards died. So right from the start, there were these feelings and fightings among the brethren of the camp. Again, spies came. They asked, who is your leader? Some said, no one in particular, sometimes one, sometimes another. They were to keep sacred who their leader was. Although threatened by our enemies that we should not pass through Indianapolis, we passed through that city on the 21st unmolested. All the inhabitants were quiet. At night, we encamped a few miles west of Indian Indianapolis. Now notice how the Lord fights our battles. There had previously been so many reports that we should never be permitted to pass through this place and that the governor would have us dispersed that some of the brethren were afraid that we might have difficulty there 
but I had told them in the name of the Lord, we should not be disturbed, and that we would pass through Indianapolis without the people knowing it. When near the place, many got into the wagons, and separating some little distance, passed through the city, while others walked down different streets, leaving the inhabitants wondering when that big company would come along. So the Lord fought their battles, blinded their eyes. Continuing, it says, the 22nd at Belleville, the 24th Wabash River, Edgar, Illinois, Sunday the 25th, we had no meeting, but attended to washing, baking, and preparing to resume, resume our journey. A man in disguise, having on an old seal-skin cap, came into our camp. He swore we were going up to Jackson County, and that we would never get over the Mississippi River alive. It was evident he was a spy, and I recollected having seen him in Jackson County, Missouri. Next we have a beautiful lesson on how the priesthood people should treat animal life. They came to a prairie, one of the first that most of the brethren had ever seen. And seeing deer off in the distance, they picked up their rifles and started running after them. But the prairie being so flat, they couldn't tell the distance. They soon found their mistake. That they deer were quite far away. We crossed the Embarrass River and encamped on a small branch of the same about one mile west. In pitching my tent we found three prairie rattlesnakes, which the brethren were about to kill, but I said, Let them alone. Don't hurt them. How will the serpent ever lose his venom? while the servants of God possess the same disposition and continue to make war upon it. Men must become harmless before the brute creation, and when men lose their vicious dispositions and cease to destroy the animal race, the lion and the lamb can dwell together, and the sucking child can play with the serpent in safety. The brethren took the serpents carefully on sticks and carried them across the creek. I exhorted the brethren not to kill a serpent, bird, or an animal of any kind during our journey, unless it became necessary in order to preserve ourselves from hunger. Our Lesson of Obedience I had frequently spoken on this subject when... On a certain occasion, I came up to the brethren who were watching a squirrel on a tree, and to prove them, and to know if they would heed my counsel, I took one of their guns, shot the squirrel, and passed on, leaving the squirrel on the ground. Brother Orson Hyde, who was just behind, picked up the squirrel and said, We will cook this, but nothing will be lost. I perceived that the brethren understood what I did it for, and in their practice gave more heed to my precept than to my example, which was right. They obeyed. This was May 26th. That night... This event took place. The reports of mobs, which were continually saluting our ears, caused the brethren to be constantly alive to the subject. And about eleven o'clock this evening, our picket guards reported that they saw the fires of the mobs on the southwest, southeast of us. I instantly arose and discovered the mistake, but wishing the brethren to enjoy the scene as well as myself, immediately discharged my gun, which was a signal to call all men to arms. 
when the companies were all paraded and ready for battle. I pointed them to the reflection of the rising moon resting on points of timber in the east, which gave the appearance of the reflection of the light of a number of campfires. The scenery was most delightful and was well worth the trouble of any man rising from his couch to witness who had never seen the like on the broad prairie before. This encouraged the prophet. This circumstance proved that nearly every man in the camp was ready for battle, except Dean Gold, who was not baptized, and Captain Jazaniah B. Smith, who was suddenly taken with a colic and did not leave his tent. May 27, 1834 Here Joseph voices or records that angels were accompanying them. Notwithstanding, our enemies were continually breathing threats of violence. We did not fear. Neither did we hesitate to prosecute our journey. For God was with us, and his angels went before us, and the faith of our little band was unwavering. We know that angels were our companions, for we saw them. One man that saw them was Parley P. Pratt, or heard one. He was a man that was sent ahead to get supplies or send messages. He records on one occasion, I had traveled all night to overtake the camp with some men and means, and having breakfasted with them and changed horses, I again started ahead on express to visit other branches and do business to again overtake them. At noon I had turned my horse loose from the carriage to feed on the grass in the midst of a broad level plain. No habitation was near. Stillness and repose reigned around me, and I sank down overpowered in a deep sleep, and might have lain in a state of oblivion till the shades of night had gathered around me, so completely was I exhausted for the want of sleep and rest. But I had only slept a few moments till the horse had grazed sufficiently, when a voice, more loud and shrill than I had ever before heard, fell on my ear, and thrilled to every part of my system, it said, Parley, it is time to be up and on your journey. In the twinkling of an eye, I was perfectly aroused. I sprang to my feet so suddenly that I could not recollect where I was or what was before me to perform. I related the circumstance afterwards to Brother Joseph Smith, and he bore testimony that it was the angel of the Lord who went before the camp, who found me overpowered with sleep, and thus awoke me. The brethren, many of them learned their lesson. There were several stories where they found rattlesnakes and carefully took them out of camp without killing them after they left Kirtland. Again, the evidence of disunity. There was some murmuring among the brethren because a horse had died and the camp was waiting for a brother Tanner to obtain a horse. There was some murmuring among the brethren, many wishing to go on and not tarry with the rest of the camp for the day, and some were already started. I sent for them to return and collected the whole company together and instructed them not to scatter. I told them that if they went ahead of the camp in a scattered condition, they would become weary, lie down on the ground when their blood was heated, and they would be liable to take diseases such as fever, which were prevalent in this climate. They would also be in danger of being killed by an enemy, and none of us be the wiser for it. They then had a mock battle between themselves, breaking into groups. 
One man was wounded in this mock battle, Heber C. Kimball. When he took hold of a sword, another man pulled the sword and cut Heber C. Kimball's hand from the palm of his hand. So Joseph called the whole camp together and cautioned the men to be careful in the future and control their spirits in such circumstances as to never injure one another. We traveled across the prairie and encamped on a strip of timber. When we stopped to dine, I wrote a letter to the brethren in Missouri dated Camp of Israel, requesting some of them to meet us as soon as possible and give me information of the state of things in Upper Missouri. He sent the letter to Springfield Post Office by Frederick G. Williams. At this place I discovered that a part of my company had been served with sour bread, while I had received good sweet bread from the same cook. I reproved Brother Zebedee Coltrane for this partiality, for I wanted my brethren to fare as well as I did, showing the character of the prophet. Again he records there were spies following them. On the 30th, we passed through Springfield. Our appearance excited considerable curiosity, and a great many questions were asked. The spies who had followed us so long pursued us very closely, changed their dress and horses several times a day. Some of the horses got sick, and I'll describe the medicine they gave the horse, horses. Brother Ezra Thayer administered this mixed in a quart bottle. A three-penny paper of tobacco, half an ounce of copperas, and two tablespoonfuls of cayenne pepper, and the bottle filled with water when he couldn't get whiskey. Put one half bottle down the horse, and they called it 18 by 24. Get the horses going again. He records how some Hiram had passed on the west the day before with the company, how spies had stayed at a certain tavern with Frederick G. Williams and Alman Babbitt, saying they had followed this camp for over 300 miles. On the 31st, at noon we halted for dinner. A man apparently drunk came to the camp and said he had a large farm and forty cows a little way ahead, and if we would go there, he would give us all we wanted to eat and drink, feed our horses, etc. But I soon discovered that he was more sober than drunk, and that he was probably a spy. Sunday, June 1st, they stopped and they preached. Many of the people in neighboring towns came to hear. All this time, the brethren didn't reveal what church they were a part of. And as they preached, the Gentiles listening to them said, One preacher is a Campbellite, another is a Methodist, another is a Baptist, because of what they talked about. On page 79, our enemies had threatened that we should not cross the Illinois River, but on Monday the 2nd we were ferried over the river without any difficulty. The ferryman counted and declared there were 500 of us. Remember, it was just 130. Yet our true number by this time was 150, he says. You can see on the map, this is the story of the Lamanite named Zelf. During our travels, we visited several of the mounds which had been thrown up by the ancient inhabitants of this country, Nephites, Lamanites. And this morning I went up on a high mound near the river, accompanied by the brethren. From this mound we could overlook the tops of the trees 
and view the prairie on each side of the river as far as our vision could extend, and the scenery was truly delightful. On the top of the mound were stones which presented the appearance of three altars having been erected one above the other according to the ancient order. The three levels of the altar represented the Aaronic, Patriarchal, and Melchizedek priesthood. And the remains of bones were strewn over the surface of the ground. The brethren procured a shovel and a hole and removed the earth to the depth of about one foot, discovered the skeleton of a man almost entire, and between his ribs the stone point of a Lamanitish arrow, which evidently produced his death. The contemplation of the scenery around us produced peculiar sensations in our bosoms, and subsequently the visions of the past being opened to my understanding by the Spirit of the Almighty, I discovered that the person whose skeleton was before us was a white Lamanite, a large, thick-set man, and a man of God. His name was Zelf. He was a warrior and chieftain under the great prophet Onondagus, who was known from the hill Cumorah or eastern sea to the Rocky Mountains. The curse was taken from Zelf, or at least in part. One of his thigh bones was broken by a stone flung from a sling while in battle years before his death. He was killed in battle by the arrow found among his ribs during the last great struggle of the Lamanites and Nephites. Joseph had inquired of the Lord because the brethren had inquired of him, says Heber C. Kimball. Marvelous! The key of revelation is in the prophet. We have no fear to follow him. June 3rd was the day Joseph stood up and warned the brethren of the coming plague on the camp. While refreshing ourselves and teams about the middle of the day, June 3rd, I got up on a wagon wheel, called the people together, and said that I would deliver a prophecy. After giving the brethren much good advice, exhorting them to faithfulness and humility, I said, The Lord had revealed to me that a scourge would come upon the camp in consequence of the fractious and unruly spirits that appeared among them, and they should die like sheep with the rot. Still, if they would repent and humble themselves before the Lord, the scourge in a great measure might be turned away. But as the Lord lives, the members of this camp will suffer for giving way to their unruly temper. Here it was, the same day anger was shown after he had spoken these words. Our supper consisted of mush and honey as we had been unable to procure flour on account of the scarcity of meals. After the fatigues of the day, it hardly satisfied hunger. But when we had finished, some six of the hams were brought to our tent and thrown down in anger and remark being, we don't eat stinking meat. I called on Brother Zebedee Coltrane, our cook, and told him to be quick and fry some ham, as I had not had my hunger fairly allayed for forty-eight hours. He immediately commenced cooking the ham, and for once my company feasted to their full satisfaction. The very same day as when he warned the camp, Now we come to a story of rebellion. This is June 1834. 
continued our journey on the 4th, we encamped on the banks of the Mississippi River. At this place we were somewhat afflicted, and our enemies strongly threatened that we should not cross over into Missouri. The river being a mile and a half wide, and having but one ferry boat, it took two days for us to pass over. While some were ferrying, others were engaged in hunting, fishing, etc. As we arrived, we encamped on the bank within limits of Missouri. So they were then in Missouri. While at this place, Sylvester Smith rebelled against the order of the company and gave vent to his feelings against myself in particular. This was the first outbreak of importance which had occurred to mar our peace since we commenced our journey. The footnote. Heber C. Kimball said, When we had all got over the Mississippi, we camped about one mile back from the little town of Louisiana in a beautiful oak grove, which is immediately on the bank of the river. At this point there were some feelings of hostility manifested again by Sylvester Smith. Why? In consequence of a dog growling at him while he was marching his company up to the camp, he being the last that came over the river. The next morning Brother Joseph told the camp that he would descend to the spirit that was manifested by some of the brethren to let them see the folly of their wickedness. He rose up and commenced speaking by saying, If any man insults me or abuses me, I will stand in my own defense at the expense of my life, and if a dog growls at me, I will let him know that I am his master. At this moment Sylvester Smith, who had just returned from where he had turned out his horses to feed, came up and hearing Brother Joseph make those remarks, said, If that dog bites me, I'll kill him. Brother Joseph turned to Sylvester and said, If you kill that dog, I'll whip you. And then went on to show the brethren how wicked and unchristian-like such conduct appeared before the eyes of truth and justice. Shortly after they crossed the Mississippi River, on June 6th, Hiram Smith brought his camp across and met Joseph's camp. It says, Making 205 men and 25 baggage wagons, two or three horses each, they were at Salt River. When both camps came together, just across the Mississippi, Joseph reorganized the camp. Joseph was commander-in-chief. Lyman White, he was elected general of the camp under Joseph. Joseph said, I chose 20 men for my lifeguards, of whom my brother Hiram was chosen captain, and George A. Smith was my armor-bearer. They were organized as they had been, twelve to a company. He dispatched Orson Hyde, Parley P. Pratt, to Jefferson City with a message to Governor Ducklin, the governor of Missouri. They sent word that they were now ready to defend themselves if he would now allow the brethren to re go back onto their lands. Governor Dunklin would send word back with these men that he would not do it. On June 15th, Joseph records, The governor refused to fulfill his promise to reinstate the brethren on their lands in Jackson County on the ground of impracticability. impracticability. Yet Joseph pressed forward with the camp. Edward Partridge, the bishop in Zion, 
came into the camp that day, June 15th, and told Joseph that the brethren generally were united in Missouri and were ready to go back to their lands in Jackson County, the Lord willing. We have a story here of treating lightly the promises of God by Martin Harris. On June 16th, Joseph records how the conditions of their travel were rough. They couldn't find water, so they drank any water they found in the horse's tracks, straining the water from the wigglers and so forth. Martin Harris, having boasted to the brethren that he could handle snakes with perfect safety while fooling with a black snake with his bare feet, he received a bite on his left foot. The fact was communicated to me, and I took occasion to reprove him and exhort the brethren never to trifle with the promises of God. I told them it was presumption for anyone to provoke a serpent to bite him. But if a man of God was accidentally bitten by a poisonous serpent, he might have faith, or his brethren might have faith for him, so that the Lord would hear his prayer, and he might be healed. But when a man designedly provokes a serpent to bite him, the principle is the same, as when a man drinks deadly poison, knowing it to be such. In that case, no man has any claim on the promises of God to be healed. The people in Jackson County, hearing of Zion's camp, now became frightened. Many of the leaders got together, called some of the brethren, like William Phelps, Sidney Gilbert, and others, Isaac Morley, come meet with us, and we will agree now to pay you for your lands in Jackson County. Their offer was just a sham, says Joseph Smith. Now that they were in Missouri, coming close to Jackson County, the mob would get anxious and gather together. One mobber named Campbell, James Campbell, was handled by God. It says, Jackson County mob to the number of about 15 with Samuel C. Owens and James Campbell at their head started for Independence, Jackson County to raise an army sufficient to meet me before I could get into Clay County. Campbell swore as he adjusted his pistols in his holsters, the eagles and turkey buzzards shall eat my flesh if I do not fix Joe Smith and his army so that their skins will not hold shucks before two days are past. They went to the ferry and undertook to cross the Missouri River after dusk. And the angel of God saw fit to sink the boat about the middle of the river, and seven out of twelve that attempted to cross were drowned. Thus suddenly and justly went they to their own place. Campbell was among the missing. He floated down the river some four or five miles, and lodged upon a pile of driftwood, where the eagles, buzzards, ravens, crows, and wild animals ate his flesh from his bones to fulfill his own words and left him a horrible example of God's vengeance. He was discovered three weeks later. Another story of rebe rebellion in the camp. June 17th. At noon we crossed the Wakenda, it being high, we had to be ferried over. We were informed here that a party of men were gathered together on the Missouri River with the intention of attacking us that night. The prairie ahead of us was twenty-three miles long without any timber or palatable healthy water. 
Some of the brethren wished to stop near the timber and were about making preparations to pitch their tents. We had but little provisions. I proposed to get some wood and water to carry with us and go on into the prairie eight or ten miles. My brother Hiram said he knew in the name of the Lord that it was best to go on to the prairie and as he was my elder brother I thought best to heed his counsel though some were murmuring in the camp. We accordingly started. When Lyman White crossed the river he disapproved of our moving on to the prairie upon which Sylvester Smith placed himself in the road turned back all that he could by saying are you following your general or some other man? And twenty stayed behind with Lyman White. We drove about eight miles on the prairie and encamped out of sight of timber. The sun apparently went down and rose again next morning in the grass. Our company had filled a couple of empty powder kegs with water. It tasted so bad we could not drink it and all the water that we had was out of a slough filled with red living animals and was putrid. About eleven o'clock Lyman White arrived and the company that had remained with him. I called them together and reproved them for tarrying behind and not obeying my counsel and told Lyman White never to do so again. He promised that he would stand by me forever and never forsake me again. Let the consequence be what it would. But Sylvester Smith manifested very refractory feelings. In another testimony I read, some of the brethren were murmuring a little because they didn't have water. And without anybody really watching, Joseph stood up, grabbed a shovel, walked to a certain place in the middle of the camp and dug a hole and walked away. After a few minutes water rose up in this hole and the brethren saw it and came and watered their horses and themselves. The Lord answering the prophet Joseph's prayer. Faith in God includes faith in his living prophet on earth and trusting his word and the Lord will bless us through our obedience that is understanding priesthood June 18th they camped near some woods and Joseph voiced how he felt very uncomfortable there he was sick that night. But forgetting his sickness, he got up, went some distance in the brush, bowed down and prayed, and prayed my heavenly Father to suffer no evil to come upon us, but keep us, us safe through the night. I obtained an assurance that we should be safe until morning, notwithstanding about fifty of the Jackson County mob crossed the Lexington Ferry that evening for the purpose of joining the Ray County mob and making an attack upon us. The next morning they quickly moved out of that place. And we have this story of the Lord fighting their battles. A certain farmer informed some of the camp members the mob was gathering. We traveled but a short distance when one wagon broke down and the wheels ran off from others and there seemed to be many things to hinder our progress although we strove with all diligence to speed our way forward. The Lord was slowing their progress for a reason. This night we camped on an elevated piece of land between Little Fishing and Big Fishing rivers, 
which streams were formed by seven small streams or branches. As we halted and were making preparations for the night, five men, armed with guns, rode into our camp and told us we should see hell before morning. And their accompanying oaths partook of all the malice of demons. They told us that sixty men were coming from Richmond Ray County and seventy more from Clay County to join the Jackson County mob who had sworn our utter destruction. Now came the attack of the mob. During this day the Jackson County mob to the number of about two hundred made arrangements to cross the Missouri River above the mouth of Fishing River at Williams Ferry into Clay County and be ready to meet the Richmond mob near Fishing River Ford, for our utter destruction. But after the first scow load of about forty had been set over the river, the scow in returning was met by a squall, the boat was, and had great difficulty in reaching the Jackson side by dark. When these five men, these mobbers, were in our camp, swearing vengeance, the wind, thunder, and rising cloud indicated an approaching storm, and in a short time after they left, the rain and hail began to fall. Wilford Woodruff in his journal said, Before the men came, the skies were clear, but as they were swearing with their oaths to destroy the, bread, the camp, the the cloud started in one place and grew until it covered the whole sky. The storm was tremendous. Wind and rain, hail and thunder met them in great wrath and soon softened their direful courage and frustrated all their designs to kill Joe Smith and his army. Instead of continuing a cannonading which they commenced when the sun was about one hour high, they crawled under wagons into hollow trees and filled one old shanty till the storm was over, when their ammunition was soaked and the forty in Clay County were extremely anxious in the morning to return to Jackson. Having experienced the pitiless pelting of the storm all night, and as soon as arrangements could be made, this forlorn hope took the back track for independence to join the main body of the mob, fully satisfied, as were those survivors of the company who were drowned, that when Jehovah fights, they would rather be absent. The gratification is too terrible. What happened in Zion's camp? Very little hail fell in our camp, but from half a mile to a mile around, the stones or lumps of ice cut down the crops of corn and vegetation generally, even cutting limbs from trees, while the trees themselves were twisted into withes by the wind. The lightning flashed incessantly, which caused it to be so light in our camp through the night that we could discern the most minute objects, and the roaring of the thunder was tremendous. The earth trembled and quaked, the rain fell in torrents, and united it seemed as if the mandate of vengeance had gone forth from the god of battle to protect his servants from the destruction of their enemies, for the hail fell on them and not us. And we suffered no harm except the blowing down of some of our tents and getting wet while our enemies had holes made in their hats and otherwise received damage, even the breaking of their rifle stocks and the fleeing of their horses through fear and pain. Many of my little band sheltered in an old meeting house through this night, and in the morning the water in Big Fishing River was about forty feet deep, where the previous evening it was no more than to our ankles. And our enemies swore that the water rose thirty feet in thirty minutes in the little fishing river. 
They reported that one of their men was killed by lightning and that another had his hand torn off by his horse, drawing his hand between the logs of a corn crib while he was holding him on the inside. They declared that if that was the way God fought for the Mormons, they might as well go about their business. The next morning, Joseph had all the brethren shoot their rifles and guns. We had nearly 600 shots, very few of which misfired, which shows how very careful the brethren had been in taking care of their arms during the storm. This next day, a Colonel Sconce, a member of the mob, came into camp. Desiring to know what their intentions were, for he said, I see there is an almighty power that protects this people. For I, this Colonel Scott, said, I started from Richmond with a company of armed men, having a fixed determination to destroy you, but was kept back by the storm as well, and was not able to reach you. When he entered our camp, he was seized with such a trembling that he was obliged to sit down to compose himself. And when he had made known the object of their visit, I arose, and addressing them, gave a relation of the sufferings of the saints in Jackson County, and also our persecutions generally, and what we had suffered by our enemies for our religion, and that we had come one thousand miles to assist our brethren, to bring them clothing, etc., and to reinstate them upon their own lands, and that we had no intention to molest or injure any people, but only to administer to the wants of our afflicted friends, and that the evil reports circulated about us were false, and got up by our enemies to procure our per destruction. When I had closed a lengthy speech, the spirit of which melted them into compassion they arose and offered me their hands, and said they would use their influence to allay the excitement which everywhere prevailed against us. And they wept when they heard of our afflictions and persecutions, and learned that our intentions were good. A footnote says, It was said of Joseph Smith that if he could but once get the attention of even his bitterest enemies, his native eloquence inspired by the truth and the pathos of his people's suffering usually overwhelmed them. Joseph had the power to convince people of the truth. But that very same day, the cholera began. Ezra Thayer and Joseph Hancock are sick with the cholera. Previous to crossing the Mississippi River, I had called the camp together and told them that in consequence of the disobedience of some who had been unwilling to listen to my words but had rebelled, God had decreed that sickness should come upon the camp. And if they did not repent and humble themselves before God, they should die like sheep with the rot, that I was sorry, but could not help it. The scourge must come. Repentance and humility might mitigate or lessen the chastisement, but cannot altogether avert it. But there were some who would not give heed to my words. The famous quote Father reads from Wilford Woodruff is, They treated Joseph like just one of the boys. They didn't realize his position before the Lord. They did not understand priesthood and the position of that one man, the prophet of God in our midst. Joseph received section 105, which we don't have time to read tonight. I'll finish tonight's story with page 114. This night the cholera on June 24th 
burst forth among us, and about midnight it was manifested in its most virulent form. Our ears were saluted with cries and moanings and lamentations on every hand. Even those on guard fell to the earth with their guns in their hands. So sudden and powerful was the attack of this terrible disease. At the commencement, I attempted to lay on hands for their recovery. But I quickly learned by painful experience that when the great Jehovah decrees destruction upon any people and makes known his determination, man must not attempt to stay his hand. The moment I attempted to rebuke the disease, our prophet says, through his love, I was attacked, and had I not desisted in my attempt to save the life of a brother, I would have sacrificed my own. The disease seized upon me like the talons of a hawk, and I said to my brother, to the brethren, if my work were done, you would have put me in the ground without a coffin. It continued for several days until Joseph finally said, call the brethren together after a week of suffering the cholera. The first of July. I told them if they would humble themselves before the Lord in covenant to keep his commandments and obey my counsel, the prophet's directions, the plague should be stayed from that hour, and there should not be another case of the cholera among them. The brethren covenanted to that effect with uplifted hands, and the plague was stayed. But it was during a week's time that fourteen were killed to sixty-three were seized by the disease. Heber C. Kimball records how he was seized while he was burying one of the brethren. And he had to he started running and thrashing and falling on the ground and trying to get his blood moving again. And he says he felt like he never wanted to sin again. He felt like he wanted to keep the commandments of God as he went through that experience of the color. Uncle Roy in the sermon said, If this people were prepared, Zion could be redeemed tomorrow. Remembering also at the same time, he said, all things that are being done are being done in their time. Our prophet is cleaning up this people, calling upon us to purify our lives. We see by this experience of Zion's camp what we must avoid and also what we must do. And may we come to the true understanding of priesthood. I say again, this is one of the most famous stories of Joseph Smith's history. But the lessons have not been learned yet. For the people have treated lightly the keyholder of priesthood all these many years. May we be that people that finally learn priesthood and this great lesson from Zion's camp and not just study the story and say yes we believe it but let us move as a Zion's camp and finally learn this lesson of Zion's camp I pray in the name of Jesus Christ Amen